Chapter 18 Another day was over. In the soft dark, the cotton truck spilled the pickers out and roared out of the yard with a sound like a giant's fart. The workers stepped around in circles for a few seconds as if they had found themselves unexpectedly in an unfamiliar place. Their minds sagged. In the store, the men's faces were the most painful to watch, but I seemed to have no choice. When they tried to smile to carry off their tiredness as if it was nothing, the body did nothing to help the mind's attempt at disguise. Their shoulders drooped even as they laughed, and when they put their hands on their hips in a show of jauntiness, the palms slipped the thighs as if the pants were waxed. Even Sister Henderson, well back where we started, huh? Yes, sir, Brother Stewart, back where you started, bless the Lord. Mama could not take the smallest achievement for granted. People whose history and future were threatened each day by extinction considered that it was only by divine intervention that they were able to live at all. I find it interesting that the meanest life, the poorest existence, is attributed to God's will. But as human beings become more affluent, as their living standard and style begin to ascend the material scale, God descends the scale of responsibility as a commensurate speed. That's just who get the credit. Yes, ma'am, the blessed Lord. Their overalls and shirts seem to be torn on purpose, and the cotton lint and dust in their hair gave them the appearance of people who had turned gray in the past few hours. The women's feet had swollen to fill the discarded men's shoes they wore, and they washed their arms at the well to dislodge dirt and splinters that had accrued to them as part of the day's pickings. I thought them all hateful, to have allowed themselves to be worked like oxen and even more shameful to try to pretend that things were not as bad as they were. When they leaned too hard on the partly glass candy counter, I wanted to tell them shortly to stand up and assume the posture of a man, but Mama would have beaten me if I opened my mouth. She ignored the creaks of the counter under their weight and moved around, filling their orders and keeping up conversation. Going to put your dinner on, Sister Williams? Bailey and I helped Mama, while Uncle Willie sat on the porch and heard the day's account. Praise the Lord, no ma'am. Got enough left over from last night to do us. We going home and we get cleaned up to go to the revival meeting. Go to church in that cloud of weariness? Not go home and lay those tortured bones in a feather bed? The idea came to me that my people may have may be a race of masochists and that not only was it our fate to live the poorest, roughest life, but that we liked it like that. I know what you mean, Sister Williams. Got to feed the soul just like you feed the body. I'm taking the children too, the, the Lord willing. Good books say raise a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. That's what it say. Sure is what it say. The cloth tent had been set on the flatlands in the middle of a field near the railroad tracks. The earth was carpeted with a silky layer of dried grass and cotton stalks. Collapsible chairs were poked into the still soft ground, and large wooden cross was hung from the center beam at the rear of the tent. Electric lights had been strung from behind the pulpit to the entrance flap and continued outside on poles made of rough two by fours. Approached in the dark, the swaying bulbs looked lonely and purposeless, not as if they were there to provide light or anything meaningful. And the tent, that blurry, bright, three-dimensional A, was so foreign to the cotton field that it might just get up and fly away before my eyes. People suddenly visible in the lamplight streamed toward the temporary church. The adults 
voices relayed the serious intent of their mission. Greetings were exchanged, hushed. Evening, sister. How you? Bless the Lord, just trying to make it in. Their minds were concentrated on the coming meeting, soul to soul, with God. This was no time to indulge in human concerns or personal questions. The Lord, the good Lord, give me another day, and I am thankful. Nothing personal in that. The credit was God's, and there was no illusion about the central positions shifting or becoming less than itself. Teenagers enjoyed revivals as much as adults. They used the night outside meetings to play at courting. The impermanence of collapsible church added to the frivolity, frivolity, and their eyes flashed and winked and the girls giggled little silver drops in the dusk while the boys postured and swaggered and pretended not to notice. The nearly grown girls wore skirts as tight as the custom allowed, and the young men slicked their hair down with moraline hairdressing and water. To small children, though, the idea of praising God in a tent was confusing, to say the least. It seemed somehow blasphemous. The lights hanging slack overhead, the soft ground underneath, and the canvas wall that faintly blew in and out like cheeks puffed with air made for the feeling of a country fair. The nudgings and jerks and winks of the bigger children surely didn't belong in a church, but the tension of the elders, their expectation, which waited like a thick blanket over the crowd, was the most perplexing of all. Would the gentle Jesus care to enter into that transitory setting? The altar wobbled and threatened to overturn, and the collection table sat at a rakish angle. One leg had yielded itself to the loose dirt. Would God the Father allow his only son to mix with this crowd of cotton pickers and maids, washerwomen and handymen? I knew he sent his spirit on Sundays to the church. But after all that was a church, and the people had had all day Saturday to shuffle off the cloak of work and the skin of despair. Everyone attended the revival meetings. Members of the hoity-toity Mount Zion Baptist Church mingled with the intellectual members of the African Methodist Episcopal and African Methodist Episcopal Zion and the plain working people of the Christian Methodist Episcopal. These gatherings provided the one time in the year when all these good people, all those good village people associated with the followers of the Church of God in Christ, the latter were looked upon with some suspicion because they were so loud and raucous in their services. Their explanation that the good book say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord and be exceedingly glad, did not in the least minimize the condescension of their fellow Christians. Their church was far from the others, but they could be heard on Sunday, a half a mile away, singing and dancing until they sometimes fell down in a dead faint. Members of the other churches wondered if the holy rollers were going to heaven after all their shouting. The suggestion was that they were having their heaven right here on earth. This was their annual revival. Mrs. Duncan, a little woman with a bird face, started the service. I know I'm a witness for my Lord. I know I'm a witness for my Lord. I know I'm a witness. Her voice, a skinny finger, stabbed high in the air, and the church responded. From somewhere down front came the jangling sound of a tambourine. Two beats on no, two beats on I'm a, and two beats on the end of witness. Other voices joined the near shriek of Mrs. Duncan. They crowded round and tenderized the tone. Hand claps snapped in the roof and solidified the beat. When the song reached its peak in sound and passion, a tall, thin man 
who had been kneeling beside the altar all the while, stood up and sang with the audience for a few bars. He stretched out his long arms and grasped the platform. It took some time for the singers to come off their level of exaltation, but the minister stood resolute until the song unwound like a child's play toy and lay quiet, quieted in the aisles. Amen. He looked at the audience.